So today uh, I will present you the proof of the Radon Nicodem theorem. So I will consider um, some measure space where mu it's a sigma finite and non-negative. So mu is taking non-negative uh, values. And then I have um, defined the same sigma algebra and nu, which is also sigma finite. But which uh, takes values between minus infinity and plus infinity. And uh, let me introduce two notions. Uh, one of them I already presented, but I will state it again. I will say that nu is absolutely continuous with respect to mu and I will represent this relation by this symbol. So nu is absolutely continuous uh, with respect to mu. If um, a set A which has measure zero with respect to mu implies that it has measure zero with respect to nu. And an example, it's of course if you take f an integrable function and you define nu of a as the integral over a of f d mu. So uh, you see f it's integrable, but I'm not assuming that f to be non-negative, so nu takes negative values. 2 may take uh, negative values. And uh, we know that if the set a has measure 0 with respect to mu, then this integral is 0. So this measure is absolutely continuous with respect to mu. Right? Whenever a has measure 0 with respect to mu, it has also measure 0 with respect to nu. And uh, the radon nicodem one of the statements of the radon nicodem theorem, it's uh, the converse of this inequality, which will of this implication, in the sense that if nu is absolutely continuous with respect to mu, we will find the function f which, um, in, which allows you to represent mu as uh, this integral with respect to that function f. So this is uh, one of the assertions of the radon nicodem theorem. And this is the uh, first concept, which is the absolutely uh, continuity. Now let me introduce a second concept, which um, is singularity. So, We will say that nu is singular with respect to mu, and that concept will be represented by this symbol. So this means that nu it's uh, it's singular with respect to mu, or that uh, nu and mu are singular measures if there exists a set A in the sigma algebra F such that mu of a is equal to 0, and mu of a complement is equal uh, to 0. And for that, um, I'm assuming here that mu is, uh, no, is taking non-negative values. So in this um, definition, I'm assuming that mu um, takes only non-negative values. Right. 
So this means not only that nu of a complement is equal to zero, but that any subset of a complement has also a measure uh, equal to zero, which will not be the case if nu uh, could take non-negative values. Right? So um, if in this definition mu and nu are two um, measures taking non-negative values, we will say that they are singular if we can find a set A for which uh, mu of A is zero and mu of A complement is zero. And uh, let me give you an example. Well, very simple example. Let's take lambda, uh, the Lebesgue measure on the line. And now let's take mu, a measure which is, um, say, consider a sequence Cj of um, non-negative real numbers. And uh, let me represent by Q uh, an enumeration of Q as Qj. So let's say that Qj is an enumeration of Qj. And let's assume, uh, say, that this Cj form um, So there are non-negative real numbers whose sum is finite. And so I will define um, the measure nu as Cj times uh, the direct measure in Qj. So this is a measure on, um, so if x is a real number, I am representing by delta x the measure uh, which on a set A it's either 0 or 1. It's 1 if x belongs to A, and it's 0 if x does not belong to A. Um, so this is a measure which is whose support, which is concentrated on the point x and gives mass 1 to that point. So here we are giving mass cj to the point qj, and I'm summing that over all rational number. So it's clear that nu and lambda are uh, singular measures because nu it's uh, concentrated on uh, the rationals, while lambda it's concentrated on um, the irrational numbers. So if I take a to be q, then it's clear that nu of a complement it's equal to zero, right? So um, delta qj of a complement will be equal to 0 for all j. Therefore, nu of a complement will be 0. And while lambda of a, since uh, while the rationals are countable, we know that the Lebesgue measure of any countable set is equal to 0. And therefore, these two uh, non-negative measures are indeed singular, one with respect to the other. So this is uh, the second concept. And we now have all the elements to state the radon nicodin theorem. So let's state the theorem. These are our assumptions. And um, what we claim here is that there exist two measures, nu1 and nu2, such that nu can be written as nu1 plus nu2, where nu1 it's absolutely continuous with respect to mu, and nu2 it's singular with respect to mu. So uh, we have here a decomposition of this sigma finite measure. We are decomposing mu as one piece which is absolutely continuous with respect to mu, a second piece which is singular with respect to mu. This decomposition is unique. So this is uh, the first statement, say, A. Then B, the decomposition is unique. And let's say C, that uh, there exists a function F which is measurable with respect to 
um, the sigma algebra F such that the absolutely continuous part, which is nu1, nu1 of A can be written as A F D nu. So this is um, what I stated uh, before. So we are finding a function f, and which allows you to represent the absolutely continuous part of nu as an integral with respect to nu. I'm not claiming here that f is integrable. I'm just uh, stating that there exists this function, and um, for whichever set to which the left-hand side makes sense, the right-hand side also makes sense, and we have the identity, or if the right-hand side makes sense, then the left-hand side makes sense, and we have this identity. But I'm not stating that the function f is uh, integrable. So this is uh, the theorem I will prove in the next few minutes. So uh, let me give you an idea of the proof. Uh, I will first assume that um, nu is um, take values between 0 and plus infinity, then we will consider the general case. And in fact, we will assume that nu and mu are finite. So uh, I will argue that we can consider the case in which nu takes only non-negative values, and in fact that we can assume that both nu and mu are finite. So let's assume that uh, nu and mu are finite, and uh, let me sketch you the proof. So I want to define a piece which is absolutely continuous, so I want to define a piece uh, nu1 of a, such that, uh, which can be expressed through a function a f d mu. Okay. Well, but it's clear, well, if now I'm assuming that nu is uh, not negative, nu, remember, it's equal to nu1 plus nu2, which means that nu1 of a is less than or equal than nu of a for any a. So this expression is less or equal than nu of a, right? And so if there exists such a function, um, it will satisfy this inequality for any a. So what I will do, I will define h as the set of all functions f, which are measurable naturally and non-negative because nu is a non-negative measure, such that a of f d mu is less than nu of a for all a. So I will define uh, this set h, and I will try to obtain in h a function which maximizes this identity. So for that, I will define alpha as the supremum over all functions f in H, such that the supremum over the integral over the set omega of f d mu. So the problem, you see, alpha is a finite number because since f belongs to H, this integral by definition it's less than or equal to nu of omega, and I assumed that a nu and nu are finite. So this value alpha is bounded by nu of omega, therefore it's finite, and uh, the first step of the proof will consist in obtaining a function g which satisfies this identity. So my first step will B to find a function g in H such that the integral of g over omega of d mu is equal to alpha. So this will be 
uh, my first step. So once I obtain this function g, I will define new one of a as the integral over a of this function g, d mu. So new one, it's clearly absolutely continuous with respect to mu. Now, I'll take new two as new minus new one. So this is also a non-negative measure because um, by definition, since g belongs to h, this integral is less than u of a, and therefore new one of a minus new of a minus new one of a, it's uh, non-negative. So I will define new two uh, by this formula, and the second step of the proof will consist in showing that new two it's singular with respect to mu. And this that will be um, the second step of the proof. So let me just um, summarize. I will first assume that nu takes uh, non-negative values and that both mu and nu are finite, and I will prove the theorem. Then I will first argue that uh, I can drop that assumption, and finally that I can drop uh, the first assumption. And then we will discuss uniqueness of uh, the decomposition. So this is uh, the sketch of the proof. So let me remind you that I'm assuming that nu takes values in R plus and that uh, nu and nu are finite measures. So, um, as I proposed, let's denote by h the set of functions f, which uh, are measurable, which are non-negative, and such that the integral over a of f d mu is less than or equal to mu of a for all a in f. So let's define uh, this set of functions h. It's not empty because I can just take f equal to 0, and this uh, inequality it's, uh, satisfies because I'm assuming that nu is taking non-negative value. So now let's take alpha as the supremum for all functions f in h of the integral over omega of f d mu. So I'm trying to find a maximal element in H. Right? I would like um, this inequality to be true for any A, but I would like to find the maximal function F, which um, satisfies this inequality, which belongs to this set. And the way in which uh, I, we will find these maximal functions, it's by uh, finding a function G, which, uh, whose integral over omega matches alpha. So the first observation is that alpha, well, as I said, it's clearly non-negative because I take f equal to 0 here, and I get um, 0. As I said, it's an element of h, and therefore this supremum is greater or equal than 0. And we, I also argued before that alpha is finite because since f belongs to h, this integral is bounded by nu of omega, which is finite because we are assuming that mu and nu are uh, finite measures. So alpha is in fact less than or equal to nu of infinity. So now, um, let's try to find a function g in h whose integral is equal to alpha. Since alpha is finite, I can always obtain a sequence fn, n greater or equal to 1, such that, well, the integral of fn d mu over omega, and this is the last time 
uh, now that I write omega here, if there is no set, it's implicit that the set is omega. Well, on the one hand, it has to be, this integral has to be smaller than the supremum, which is alpha. But I can find alpha such that um, this integral is uh, greater or equal than alpha minus 1 over n. So we obtain that sequence. And with this sequence, we would like to construct this maximal element. And the idea will be to turn this sequence into a monotone sequence and take the limit. So in order to take uh, a monotone sequence, a natural candidate is to take the maximum. So let's define Gn as the maximum over F1, F2, Fn. And uh, it's clear that uh, Gn, it's a sequence, forms a sequence uh, which is increasing. What I claim is that Gn belongs to H. So this is <clears throat> this, my second claim. Gn belongs to H. <clears throat> well, In order to do that, <coughs> I need to estimate the integral of Gn on A with respect to mu. Since Gn is given by this maximum, uh, let me denote it by E and K, K between 1 and N, the set at which the set of points x in which g n x is equal to f k x. So uh, this family, finite family of sets, forms a partition of the set omega, because g n is the maximum. So g n has to be equal to one of these um, f functions f k. So let me call e n k the set at which uh, Gn is equal to fk. And since uh, this family Enk forms a partition, I will write this integral as the sum from 1 up to n of the integral over A intersection Enk of Gn. But now, on the set Enk, Gn is equal to fk, so I can replace um, Gn by fk. So I get a sum from 1 to n, the integral of A intersection E and k of fk d mu. Now fk, it's an element of H, right? Because we are we chose here a family which is approximating uh, the supremum family in this set H. So applying uh, this property to the set A intersection E and K, I have that this is the sum. It's bounded by the sum from 1 to n of new A intersection E and K. Now again, since E and K forms a partition of omega, this sum is just equal to nu of A, and therefore the integral of G n over A, it's bounded by nu of A for any set A. G n is clearly non-negative and belongs to, um, and it's F measurable, therefore we proved that uh, indeed the sequence that we just constructed um, it's a sequence in H. This sequence Gn, it's an increasing sequence, therefore it has a limit. Let me call G uh, the limit, and again I claim that uh, G belongs to H. So this is my third claim. G 
belongs to H. G, uh, it's uh, measurable being the limit of measurable functions. It's non-negative, so we have to prove this third property. And uh, we will use the fact that Gn belongs to F H. So let's fix a set A. We know that the integral of Gn with respect to mu on the set A, it's bounded by mu of A because Gn belongs to H. Now, by the monotone convergence theorem, since Gn is increasing, Gn is non-negative and it's increasing to G, this integral is converging to the integral of G over the set A d mu. And therefore, uh, this value is also bounded by mu of A, which proves that G belongs to H. And now, um, well, now we can conclude. I claim, I finally claim, that the integral of G with respect to mu is equal to alpha. Well, the integral of G with respect to mu has to be bounded by mu um, by alpha, because since G belongs to H and alpha is the supremum, the integral of G has to be bounded by alpha. On the other hand, the integral of G, well, it's the limit, the increasing limit of the integrals of Gn. So this is larger or equal than the integral of Gn, the mu, for any n, because just uh, g is the limit of the increasing sequence gn. And gn, it's defined as the maximum. So it's clear that gn, it's larger or equal than fn. But by construction, the integral of fn, it's bounded below by alpha minus 1 over n. Therefore, we have that the integral of g is greater or equal than alpha minus 1 over n for any n, and therefore it's greater or equal than alpha, which together with that inequality shows that the integral of g is indeed equal to alpha, and therefore we obtained our maximal function in the set H. So let me write here uh, the definition of our set H. And uh, J, it's a maximal element. <clears throat> in the set, in the sense I, I proved. Um, now, as I said, I will define new one, a new measure, which at A it's equal to A G D mu. And since G it's an element of H, this is bounded by nu of A. So I can define nu 2 of A as nu of A minus nu 1 of A. And um, what I have to prove now, because since nu1 of A is given by this expression, it's clear that nu1 is absolutely continuous with respect to mu. So to complete the proof of the theorem of our decomposition of nu, it's enough to show that nu2 is singular with respect to mu, and this is um, what we will prove now. So the idea is the following. We will uh, consider the points so such that, and this is, um, let's say, formal, but essentially what we are 
taking our uh, derivatives of this measure with respect to this measure, and we want to find the points at which uh, this is, say, uh, non-zero. So we, we expect mu2 to be um, singular with respect to mu, which means that whenever mu2 is uh, positive, then mu is zero. Whenever um, mu2 is um, zero, or whenever mu is positive, mu2 is zero. So what do we expect for this ratio? Well, we expect it that uh, whenever mu2 is um, positive, mu is zero, and therefore uh, this inequality will be satisfied. So uh, we expect the sets of points, if you allow me, x such that this ratio is bounded by 1 over n, has to have measure equal to 0 with respect to mu. Well, I just tried to introduce the following object. So let me put mu on the other side, and let me uh, take out this value. So consider this measure, sigma n. So sigma n, it's the measure nu2 minus 1 over n nu. This is a signed measure. And we have seen in the Han Jordan decomposition that uh, this signed measure has a positive set Pn and a negative set Nn. So what we know is that Pn is equal to Nn complement and that if I have any set E contained in Pn, then the measure of sigma, the sigma n measure of this set, it's non-negative. And it, if I have a set F contained in Nn, then the sigma n measure of this set, it's negative. And uh, by my argument, my previous argument, what I want to show is that mu of Pn, it's equal uh, to zero because um, Pn, as I said, corresponds to the points in which uh, this is positive, and, um, and we expect, by the argument I gave you, that the measure of this set um, is zero. So my goal, well, I introduced this measure sigma n, which is given by this difference. It's now a signed measure, and by the han jordan Theorem, I know that this sign measure has a positive part and a negative part, which I'm representing by Pn and Nn. What are the properties of the positive and the negative parts? Let me remind you. Well, one is the complement of the other. Any subset of the positive part has positive measure. Any subset of the negative part has negative measure. And my goal is to show uh, that mu of Pn uh, is equal to zero. So for that, let me uh, take the maximal function, g, and let's consider the function g plus 1 over n, the indicator of pn. What I claim is that this function belongs to h. So to prove that this function belongs to h, what I have to sh compute, well, it's certainly a non-negative function. It's uh, measurable, so I need only to check uh, the third property. So this is g plus 1 over n, the indicator of pn, d mu. There is a first piece, which is the integral of g in a with respect to mu. But this is, by definition, new one of A. Then there is uh, the measure of Pn intersection A divided by N. So plus 1 over N, the measure of Pn intersection A. Pn intersection A, of course, it's contained in 
So it's contained in the positive part. This means that the sigma n measure of Pn intersection A, it's non-negative. But what is a sigma n? We have the formula here. So this means that nu 2 of Pn intersection A minus 1 of n nu of this measure, it's positive, so this means that this measure is greater or equal than 1 over n mu of Pn intersection A. Right? So uh, it's equivalent, well, it's saying that sigma n of Pn intersection A is non negative, it's the same as nu 2 of Pn intersection A, greater or equal to 1 over n mu of Pn. So by this inequality, this expression, it's bounded by nu 1 of A plus, well, 1 over n mu of Pn intersection A, it's bounded by nu 2 of Pn intersection A. And since nu 2, it's a non-negative measure, this expression, it's still less or equal than nu 1 of A plus nu 2 of A. And this is, by definition of nu 2, this is nu of A. So this proves that the function g plus 1 over n times the indicator of pn belongs to uh, the family H. Therefore, so let me raise uh, the computation that led to this conclusion. Well, therefore, if now I take the integral of g plus 1 over n the indicator of Pn d mu. This is equal to, well, by definition of g, g is the maximal. So the integral of g, it's alpha. And then we have plus 1 over n, the measure of Pn. Therefore, if Pn has a positive mu measure, this quantity, it's strictly larger than alpha, and this contradicts um, the definition of alpha. So um, this identity implies that mu of Pn is equal to zero. And this, is, this was my claim, that mu of Pn is equal to zero. So that proves uh, the claim. And with that, we can conclude the proof that nu2 and mu are uh, singular. Well, we prove that mu of pn is 0 for all uh, n. So let me define p as the union of pn. And it's clear that mu of p is less or equal than the sum of mu of pn, which is 0 because the measure of Pn, the mu measure of Pn, is equal to zero for all n. Now, let me define n as P complement, but P complement P is the union of Pn. So this is the intersection of Pn complement, but Pn complement is n. And uh, to show that nu2 is singular with respect to mu, I have to prove that the nu2 measure of n is equal to 0. This is uh, what remains to be proven. Well, but nu2n, n, it's uh, this intersection. So this intersection is contained in any of these sets n, n. So this is less or equal than nu2 of nn. nn, it's the negative set. So the negative set means that nu2, well, means that sigma n of nn, it's negative. This is uh, because, well, nn is the negative set of uh, the sign measure sigma n. Sigma n, it's nu2 of nn minus 1 over n, 
mu of nn. So this is non-positive, it's negative, so this means that mu2 of nn, it's smaller than 1 over n mu of nn. Now, nn, it's a subset of omega, so this is bounded by 1 over n mu of omega, and mu of omega is finite. This inequality holds for all n, which implies that mu2 of n is indeed equal to 0, and therefore mu2 and mu are singular because we obtain two sets, n and p. One is the complement of the other, mu2 of n is equal to 0, and uh, mu of p n of p it's equal to 0, and, uh, which is here. So this proves, uh, so this completes the proof of the decomposition. We wrote mu as the sum of mu1 plus mu2. Mu2, it's uh, singular with respect to mu, and mu1, it's absolutely continuous with respect to mu, because we've seen that such expressions are absolutely continuous with respect to mu. So I presented a complete proof under the assumption that mu takes non-negative values and that mu and mu are finite. So now uh, let's remove that assumption. So let's assume uh, that mu and mu are sigma finite only. So they are still non-negative both but they are not finite, they are just sigma finite. Well, if mu and nu are sigma finite, I can find a sequence of set En in the algebra, which is increasing, and such that omega is equal to the union of En, and mu of En is finite. Yeah, because it's sigma finite, so I can find this sequence which is increasing such that the union is omega and each set En has finite measure. And for the same reasons, we can find sets Fn such that they are increasing, omega <coughs> is equal to the union of Fn and nu of Fn is finite. So let me uh, define Gn as the intersection of En with respect to Fn. Since En is increasing and Fn is increasing, this sequence is increasing. I claim that omega is equal to the union of Gn. Well, it's clear that the union of Gn is contained in omega, because any set is contained in omega. So now let's take a point in omega. Well, since omega is equal to the union of n, of En, there exists such some n0 such that this point x belongs to En0. But since the sequence is increasing, x in fact belongs to Ek for all k larger than n0. And the same thing can be said for Fn. So there exists N1, such that x belongs to Fn1, and in fact, x belongs to Fj for any j larger than N1. Well, this means that x belongs to the intersection of Ei Fi for any i larger than the maximum between N0 and N1, and this proves that omega is indeed contained in the union of Gn. And finally, well, mu of Gn, since Gn is contained in En, mu of Gn is finite, because mu of En is finite, and since Gn is contained in Fn, mu of Fn, of Gn, it's finite. 
So we obtained a sequence of sets, Gn, which is increasing, and such that omega is the union of Gn, and each set, Gn, has a finite measure. So let me uh, summarize uh, this in a statement. So there exists a sequence Gn, which is increasing. Omega, it's equal to, well, it's increasing to omega. And mu of Gn, it's finite. Mu of Gn, it's finite. So from Gn, I will now construct um, sets which are disjoint. So I'll construct the following sets. H1 will be uh, G1. H2 will be uh, G2 minus G1. And more generally, Hk will be Gk minus Gk minus 1. Now, since uh, the sequence Gn is increasing, all these sets are disjoint. So hi intersection hj, it's empty if i is different from j. Omega, it's equal to the union of these sets, omega j. And the measure of omega j, it's finite. And the measure of the new measure of omega j, it's finite. So now, <coughs> What we will do is that we will work with the measure mu and mu restricted to hj. So we'll define mu j of a set A as mu of hj intersection A and mu j of A as mu of aj intersection A. So these are now two uh, finite measures, and we can apply the radon nicodym theorem. So we can write mu j as mu 1j plus mu 2j, where mu 1j it's absolutely continuous with respect to mu j, and mu 2j it's singular with respect to mu j. Right, so what we, we did, we had a set omega here, and we divided the set omega in sets h1, h2, and so on, which were disjoint. In each of these sets h1, we divided mu in two pieces, one which is absolutely continuous, and one which is um, singular with respect to mu. One. So uh, now by adding these measures, so by taking mu1 as the sum of the new 1j and mu2 as the sum of mu 2j, it's easy to show that mu1 it's absolutely continuous with respect to mu, and that mu2 it's singular with respect to mu, right? Because mu2, for instance, will be singular on each set hk. So on each set, each set h1, you divided h1 in two sets, one set which concentrates the measure mu and the other set which concentrates the measure mu2. You, you did that in each of these sets h. So by taking the union of these supports, of mu and the union of the supports of mu2, you get um, sets in which mu2 are concentrated, mu are concentrated, and the intersection is empty. Also, uh, you obtain a function which uh, allows you to represent mu1 in terms of this function on the set, say, h2, with respect to mu, a new function here in the set h1, new function in a, another function in H3. So putting together these functions with their indicator of the sets H3, H3, H1, H2, and so on, you obtain a function which allows you to represent a new one in terms of the integral of mu. And therefore, new one will be absolutely continuous. 
So uh, I leave it to you the, the details, but once you have constructed these sets H, J, you can just apply the theorem in each of these sets and then add together all these measures to get the measure nu1 and nu2 and sh easily show that uh, nu1 is absolutely continuous and nu2 it's um, and that nu2 it's singular with respect uh, to mu. So up to this point we proved the radom nikodym theorem and the assumption that nu takes non-negative value. So let's remove this last assumption. So let's assume now uh, that mu and nu are sigma finite and that nu takes values in between minus infinity and plus infinity. Well, in this case, uh, by the Han Jordan theorem, you know that nu can be written as a positive part minus a negative part. So there exist two functions, two measures, which I will call um, maybe theta 1 and theta 2. So now theta 1 and theta 2 takes non-negative values. And so there are uh, measures which have a positive sign. And theta 1 and theta 2 are sigma finite, so you can apply the theorem to theta 1 and theta 2. So you can write uh, theta 1 as theta 1, 1 plus theta 1, 2, where theta 1, 1 it's absolutely continuous with respect to mu, and theta 1, 2, it's singular with respect to mu. In the same way, theta 2 can be decomposed as an absolutely continuous piece with respect to mu, plus an absolute uh, singular piece with respect to mu. If you remember, theta 1 and theta 2, they have disjoint support. So you, you wrote omega, you divided omega in two pieces, a positive part for theta, which is the support of theta 1, and a negative part, which is the support of theta 2. So theta 1 uh, takes value only on P. All subsets of N have measure 0 with respect to theta 1. And in a similar way, theta 2, the support of theta 2 is the set n, in the sense that any subset of P has measure 0 with respect to theta 2. So, uh, you, these two uh, measures have the same property as theta 1. So their support are concentrated theta 1, 1 and theta 1, 2, the support of these two measures are concentrated on this set. So any subset of n has measure 0 with respect to theta 1 and theta, theta 1, 1 and theta 1, 2. And similarly for uh, theta 2, 1 and theta 2, 2. So by adding these two pieces, so for this function, for this measure, you constructed a function which I will represent it by f11 and for that measure you constructed a function f12. Um, the support of this function, so this function takes value 0 in the set n while the function f12 takes value equal to 0 on the set p. Almost surely, of course. This means almost surely with respect to mu. Now, if I add these two functions, and since uh, theta 2 is negative, I will add with a minus sign here, so I will define f11 um, as f11 minus f12. This function, it's exactly the radon nicodym derivative, or more precisely, any set A is such that nu of A 
it's equal to the integral over a of the function f1 with respect to mu. This is what I claim because I will define the set a in the set p and in the set n. In the set p, I will work with the positive part, so it will work with theta 1, 1. And in the set n, I will work with the negative part, so that with function f 2, 1, and use their properties, which uh, we proved already. So uh, this will provide me the absolutely continuous part of nu. And then we have a singular part. And here again, well, theta 1, 2, it's concentrated on p. Theta 2, 2, it's concentrated on p. So this means that here on p, I obtain, I divided p in two sets. One set which concentrates the measure mu, and the other set which concentrates the measure nu, uh, sorry, theta um, 2, 2, 2, 1, 1, 2. And here again, um, we divided the set n in two pieces, one which is the support of mu, and the other piece which is the support of theta 2, 2. And therefore, by adding these two sets, we get a set which, is the, which uh, contains the support of mu. By adding these two sets, we obtain um, a set which contains the support of the measure theta 2, which um, theta, uh, I want to write it theta 2, which is theta 2, 1 minus theta 2, 2. And this uh, completes the proof in the general case, so without the assumption that nu takes um, positive values only. So I didn't give uh, all details, but um, this part is uh, quite simple. Um, I hope that you can fill the gaps I left in uh, this proof and in that proof. So let's go back to the statement of the theorem. We proved um, A assertion, the first assertion of the theorem, so that we obtained the composition of the measure mu, nu as a sum of two measures, one which is absolutely continuous and the other one which is singular. Now uh, I want to prove that the decomposition is unique. So let's assume that uh, there exists two uh, decompositions, so that I can write nu as uh, nu1 plus nu2 and nu as nu1 bar plus nu2 bar. So let's assume that nu1 and nu1 bar are absolutely continuous with respect to nu, and that nu2 and nu2 bar are singular with respect to nu2. And I want to show that uh, nu1 is equal to nu1 bar, nu2 is equal to uh, nu2 bar. So I will write this identity as nu1 minus nu1 bar, it's equal to nu2 bar minus nu2. Now I know uh, that nu2 and nu2 bar are singular with respect to nu. So what does that mean? That, that means there exists a set A such that uh, mu of A is equal to 0 and nu2 uh, of A intersection any set f, it's equal to 0. So for all nu2, mu of a is equal to 0, and nu2 of a complement intersection f, it's equal to 0 for any f. And uh, in the same way, since nu1 bar is um, singular, I'm sorry, here I'm taking nu2, so since nu2 bar is singular with respect to mu, there exists a set b such that mu of b is equal to 0, and mu 2 bar of b complement intersection g, that this is equal to 0 for any g in the sigma algebra f. Right? Any subset of a complement has mu 2 measure 0, any uh, subset g of B complement has nu2 bar measure equal to 0. So let me take uh, A union B. So 
So let me call that set C. So of course, mu of C is equal to 0 because the measure of C is bounded by the measure of A plus the measure of B, which is 0. Now, let me take a set uh, E. And I will uh, decompose the set E according to E intersection A union B and E intersection A union B complement. And I want to show that um, these two sets are uh, equal, have measures equal to zero in the sense that uh, on the one hand, mu of A intersection E intersection E union B, this is equal to zero because mu of A union B, which I call C, has measure zero. So this set has measure zero. Well, but this implies, since nu1 and nu1 bar are absolutely continuous with respect to mu, this implies that nu1 and nu1 bar of this set have measure zero, and therefore uh, nu1 Okay, let me write that. New one of E intersection A union B. It's equal to new one bar E intersection E union B, which is equal to zero. And now let's take, um, let's consider the second piece. New two. Um, of E intersection, the complement of A in and B, it's E intersection A complement, intersection B complement. But this set, it's contained in A complement and therefore has measured nu2 equal to zero. And in the same way, nu2 bar of this set A intersection A complement, intersection B complement, it's contained in B complement and therefore has measured nu2 bar equal to zero. So um, what do we conclude from that? Let me erase this piece which I will not use anymore. Well, we have that new one minus new bar one of the set E, which is equal. So I will take E intersection A union B and E intersection A union B complement. So this is can be written in two pieces. New one minus new one bar of E intersection A union B plus nu1 minus nu1 bar A intersection A union B complement. Well, we have seen that nu1 A intersection A union B and nu1 bar A intersection A union B is equal to zero. So this first piece is equal to zero. Right, because both, in fact, both terms are equal to zero. While for the second piece, let me use that identity to write uh, the second term as nu2 bar minus nu2 of A intersection A union B complement. And now let me use um, these two identities to claim that each of these terms is equal to zero. So that second line due to that identity is equal to zero. Therefore, nu1 minus nu1 bar of E is equal to zero. E is any set which proves that nu1 is equal to nu1 bar. And once you have that nu1 is equal to nu1 bar, we conclude that nu2 is equal to uh, nu2 bar, which proves um, the uniqueness of the decomposition of new in a piece which is absolutely continuous and a piece which is 
singular with respect to mu. So we just proved uh, the second assertion of the theorem that the decomposition is unique. Now let me comment briefly on the uh, last assertion. We have seen that uh, the absolutely continuous part can indeed be written as uh, the integral of a function over a set. So we proved the existence of this function, which was obtained by the maximal uh, function on some set. So I, what I just want to comment is that, of course, if f is equal to g almost surely, then uh, this integral is equal to a g d mu. We have seen that uh, whenever these integrals are well defined. So remember, I'm not claiming that f is integrable. Uh, its integral could be finite, but what will happen is that if you restrict uh, this integral to a certain set, then uh, these, uh, these integrals will be um, well defined, will be finite. So um, what I'm saying is that if you take a function g, which is almost surely equal to f, and uh, if this integral is well defined, it's, uh, so if it takes a real number, then it's equal to that one. And th that we have seen. In particular, this means that uh, the function f, it's not uh, unique. Well, it will be unique uh, modulo sets of zero measure. And this is, uh, well, this completes the proof of the, uh, the Radom-Nikodim uh, theorem, which will be uh, used many, uh, many times.